place. Go ahead and see who's going to give me a ride uptown. He's all built up.
in a good spot right at the bay. Yeah. No, but you're
No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I just wanted to say how appreciative I am that Sterling and the Legion actually have this event today to honor our veterans and our military personnel. And thank you all for coming. I can't express uh, how important it is that we continue to remember, we never forget, and we continue to support our military personnel. So thank you again for coming today. Sterling has never forgotten, even though this Veterans Day, this 
began as Armistice Day, in recognition of the end of the First World War, Sterling has not forgotten the admonition of Lincoln in the second inaugural address that it was their duty to bind the wounds of a nation and to look after those who have borne the battle in their widow and orphan. And here in Massachusetts, we go long before that. In the records of the State House where Representative Ferguson and I work, it is shown that soon after the raising of the first militia in this Commonwealth in 1636 on the Salem Green, it was decided that those returning from battle needed to be cared for, and their widows and orphans, and military families. And that has borne through, through the Revolutionary War beginning at Concord and Lexington, through the early wars in the Republic, War of 1812, the Mexican War, the Indian War, the Civil War, where thousands of sons and daughters of Massachusetts were lost. Through the Spanish War, one of the brigades that went up San Juan Hill with Teddy Roosevelt was an Irish brigade from Massachusetts alongside the Buffalo Soldiers and the U.S. Volunteers. Through the First World War, through the wars of this century, up until current times. Massachusetts has never forgotten. I'm a different breed of cat. I was older when I went in. But I remember the young soldiers that I served with. I'll never forget that I still currently serve with the reserve. 17 and 18 years old, 19 years old. I was at the funeral for Specialist Brian Arsenault from Northborough a few weeks ago. And his uncle told me a story that some fellow members of the 82nd Airborne came up from Fort Bragg. And the night before the funeral, they were sitting around, and at 9 o'clock, they broke up a couple of bottles of whiskey and some cigars, as soldiers are wont to do. And they started passing shots of whiskey around as they were smoking the cigars. And all of a sudden, a very respectful young Southern soldier leaned over to the uncle. And in a thick, thick Southern drawl, said, Sir, do you mind if I don't have a drink? and brightest that this country have to offer. And towns like Sterling don't forget. And that is right. Because the changing needs of veterans don't stop. We've still got a significant number of World War II veterans among us. Our Korean veterans. We have Vietnam veterans that are approaching the age of 70. There are peacetime veterans. And our Gulf War and Iraq and Afghan veterans. We'll be dealing with the issues of these people for 70 or 80 years to come. So we can't forget. We must be the nation that looks after he who was born the battle and their widow and orphan, and she who was born the battle and her family. 20% of our veterans are female. To remember the different needs of our female veterans. 22 veterans a day commit suicide. That is a sin. And we are working hard towards finding out the cause, and it's not one single cause. But the fact that we even have to address it says a lot. That's almost a platoon. If we were losing a platoon today in Afghanistan, three divisional commanders would lose their jobs, Republicans and Democrats alike would be bloviating on MSNBC and Fox News. What's going wrong? But because they're back here, they're sometimes out of sight and out of mind. Towns like Sterling will not let that be forgotten. Let me close with this. And if you've heard it before, forgive me. But it's something that means a lot. The night before my first tour in Iraq, I sat at the old timers in Clinton with my dad. And many of you knew he himself had been a veteran of the first, Second World War, 4th Infantry Division, which when I got deployed with that same outfit to Afghanistan a couple of years later meant a lot to me. He had been a medic in Utah Beach. Never spoke of the war. There's so many of that generation. And I asked him, tell me about your war before I go. This was the summer of 2005, the height of the insurgency in Iraq. And he started laughing and he said, what's to tell? And a twinkle in his eye. 
And I said, well, you're a medic in the first wave in Normandy. You probably have a couple stories. And he said, he looked around the bar, the old timers, and he pointed to some people who had had been through some trials and tribulations in their lives. And how they overcame them. We held their families together, our community together, their businesses together. And he said, you don't need to put a uniform on to be a hero. Look to these people. And then he said to me, here's the deal. You come back in a year in one piece, we'll come back here, and I'll tell you my stories, and you can tell me yours. And as many of you know, I had to come back about seven months later on emergency leave because he was sick and he passed away. So we never got those stories, the opportunity to tell those stories. And I look to you veterans to tell these young people. But I don't tell you that story out of any sense of seeking any sense of sympathy. I tell you because of the last thing that he said to me as we walked out that night. He said, never forget the faces of the people in there and all the struggles that they've been through, the whole of this town and this state and this community and this country together. Because that's why you go and fight. That's why you go. To allow them the opportunity to live their lives successfully and to keep their families together. As my wife and I sat drinking, co drinking coffee this morning and watched the morning news shows talking about the events of Election Day this past week and the fact that 1,500 young Americans are now headed into harm's way again in Iraq. And I'm sorry to say, I don't think that'll be the last that go back there, that tortured nation. It struck me that his words never held truer than they did today. That's why we go forward. To allow people to live their lives in that freedom. And that's why great towns like Sterling still turn out on days like this and honor the veterans. Keep it up, Sterling. I'm proud to be part of it. spirit which it engenders. Those who offered their lives, sacrifice their all, a magnificent abandon. Heroism became contagious. Let us strive to see the same spirit of self-sacrifice as cultivated in peace as it has been exhibited in war. It behooves us to rear new standards of success, to inspire youth in peace as youth is inspired in war. Let us honor the heroes of science who alleviate human suffering and carry to greater heights the standards of civilization. Let us also honor those who in public service seek not how much they may secure from the nation, that, but how much they can give. 
Let us honor those who devote their lives to that education which will lead our children on in life, laugh and, to live, laugh, and learn, and love as we have only dreamed of doing. Let us honor those veterans who carry into ordinary affairs of life the noble idealism, sincere capacity of self-devotion. In peace, we shall go forward together to scale new heights of achievement in unity of purpose and sacrifice for the common good, in tolerance for those of different faiths and creeds, in bravery to fight for social and economic gains, and in the discipline of good citizenship. We shall move forward as a strong nation in a peaceful world. Let us hope that that peace shall soon come and conflict is over, and that troops will serve around the world to maintain peace instead of waging war. Now I'd like to ask everybody that can, please stand for the playing of our national anthem.